going in their veins. Mackie and Judd on Score North and scorenorth.com. The standings in June don't really carry any significance um, for me. And those are things that we said when we were, uh, you know, in first place. It doesn't matter what place you're in. As long as you got a chance, um, you got plenty of games to play. Uh, I think we're in a still a – we put ourselves in a, in a good spot to go forward. Um, we need to get ready for tomorrow. We need to get ready to go out there and, and beat these guys and outplay them tomorrow. I have a classic open-ended – Sports talk show question for you, Judd. How much do the standings matter in the month of June? Quantify how much do they matter? If you are if you're tied for first place uh, and your percentage points behind your opponent, they really don't. Um, but I think you know what does matter ultimately in June is is what you are learning about your ball club. That's what matters. Cleveland's bullpen. Which, by the way, the Twins got to. Very impressive. But Cleveland's bullpen is damn good. Uh, and, and it goes back to, I think, the first few years that we did the old show, Phil. Uh, Kansas City had that just lights-out bullpen. And if you got to, like, the sixth, it was curtains. It's like, okay, this is going to be a long night. So um, the standings, to me, unless you're where the Twins were a year ago, in which case you're screwed, the standings aren't what's important, but it's what it, what are you – learning about your ball club, and more importantly, what can your own club do then to counter that because you know things about Cleveland that you didn't know a few months ago? Is Cleveland, is Cleveland for real? Cleveland's, Cleveland is, what's their payroll? They, the isn't third it like $40 lowest million dollars yes. or something? Yes, they are, try, they are trying to break their fans' hearts or make them not care, <laughs> and they are it's not nuts. successful. And it's largely, be, I mean, that bullpen is great. It is. Uh, yeah, it's ridiculous. But that being said, here's the thing, in my opinion, about this division, and it's why I'm not ousting the White Sox completely yet. I think teams like the Twins, Cleveland, and the White Sox are for real in this division. So if you transplanted them to the American League East, they're not for real. <laughs> but The fire Tony division, chance route again yesterday, I saw. I hope they Today. don't. Every night. Today, I hope Today. they don't fire Tony. If they fire guys. Tony, I got a bad feeling they're going to get guys back and take off. <laughs> Tony! Tony! What are you doing? Tony! Tony! Tony. The Tony. Guardians payroll is $67 million. It's the third lowest payroll yeah. in the entire league. The Orioles payroll is $45 million. The A's payroll is $48 million. Mm-hmm. And then uh, you got the Guardians and the Pirates are $71 million. The Marlins... $82 million payroll. Moving on up in the world. Twins, by the way, are just below league average with a $138 million. Mm. These are opening day payrolls. Cheap Twins goals. are right right above the Tigers and Rockies and Brewers, right behind the Rangers and the the, the, the sort of the tanking Cubs had to strip their payroll down to $147 the Rickets, million. I feel so bad for them. I mean, they bought all that property in that expensive area around the ballpark, and now they don't have mm. any money left. Oh, they got a ring. Another oh, hundred eighty years of satisfaction. Here's all right. Here's here's how I feel about the Twins right now. And I last I thought last night's game was actually really fun. I know people are kind of pissed off the way that they squandered chances. They had that you know Arise hits that home run, and it should have been Great. should have been lights out from that point forward. Then you give up the two run homer. You know Pagan serves it up and extra innings, etc. But um, you know I don't. You're gonna lose a tough close game sometimes. So I'm not too worked up about last night's game. But I think if you zoom back out to the macro here, it just kind of feels like the, the Twins have been, I think, four games below 500 over the past month. They got off to such a hot start. Injuries, COVID, and I think just some natural regression. This was not supposed to be a 95 or a 100 win team even after the Carlos Correa signing. The Carlos Correa signing and the Sonny Gray trade put them into competitive range. It didn't put them into... World Series contention range. And they came out of the gate a little hotter than maybe they were supposed to be. And uh, they've done some great work to at least flirt with contention. You know, they've they put themselves in a spot with the Correa signing and the Sonny Gray trade, the Byron Buxton plan, which has worked pretty well to this point. He's about to surpass his previous career high in home runs. And Luis Arise is having a great so all that All that stuff is great, and it put them in – position to maybe contend at some point. But now it's up to the front office and it's up to the ownership group to push this thing over the top. 
And I don't know if you can push it over the top and be the Yankees because the Yankees are literally on pace for 120 plus victories. Um, but I just I, I don't think you can sit here and say, all right, job well done in the month leading up to the season. Now let's ride this thing for six months. If you actually want to be the best team in this division, win a playoff game, there needs to be probably two or three pitchers added to this collection in the next month or so. The trade deadline's in five weeks from now. Right. So that's my take on it. If you want to go further, it's 100% up to management and ownership. If you don't, then, all right, then I guess why would you sign Carlos Correa in the first place? Like, you sign him to be better and to be interesting and compete. Right. Why would why would you then not make other moves going forward? And where that gets intriguing to me is, and you brought this up, I think it was last week, Phil, after doing some more inciting in Seattle, you said that Carlos Correa behind the scenes is, you know, basically rightfully so saying, Hey, here's what we should do. Or here's a good idea. Or are we going to do things? Yeah. He's not being um, a malcontent or anything, but he, right. yeah, he's right. But I mean, he's pushing to try to win, which is outstanding. Good for him. But with that being said, what I find to be interesting about that is if you think about what he wants, um, he is almost certainly going to opt out after this season and potentially move on. But you know what? It's going to have an impact on the, this franchise, what they do. So like if the Twins are like, you know what, Carlos, you're exactly right. We're going to make some trades here. And by the way, pitching-wise, we need help. Uh, we're, we're going to add at least an arm or two in the bullpen. And I'm not talking about Sam Dyson. We're going to add a starter because we definitely need uh, top-of-the-rotation starting help. If they don't and Correa leaves, he's not going to leave here and be like man the twins did everything in my year there to win he's gonna be like well they really didn't do much so i you know we know for a fact it's especially true in basketball but i think it's true in all sports now because so many guys bounce around that there is a thing with the upper echelon players who get a chance to play in a or a team that they share their experience right so like if if the Twins try their best to win, Carlos Correa, whether he leaves or not, is going to have had a positive experience here. And I think that's important because that's going to shape the next guy who, you know, and I know that this is a, it feels like a fluke, but the next guy that comes along who's like, ah, oh, yeah, you know what? I sort of like the Twins. Might not stay there for a long time, but I don't mind. Might say, well, screw that. I talked to my guy, Carlos, and he said they didn't lift a finger to try and win in season. And that's the one thing. The Twins, just to be very clear, the new incarnation of this team has done things, I think, that we can definitely point to in the wintertime that are aimed at trying to win. Like they've made some big trades. They've done some things. You cannot accuse them of doing nothing. What I think we're yet to see, though, is a deadline deal where I know it's painful, I know there's prospects involved, but you say this is a prime time to try to go for it. But part of their business model, so I'm going to I'm gonna speak sort of, put myself in the shoes of a poll ad here for a second, all right? Mm. Put myself in the, in the shoes of Jim. Just be sort of introverted and a little bit weird as I talk here. <laughs> so they would say listen we're never we're, we don't have the revenue coming in to spend with and by the way let me back up a step every owner in baseball is a billionaire or multi worth multiple billions of dollars so they they're not pulling money out of their own checking accounts to pay for free agents they're they're all spending within the parameters of the revenue that the franchises bring in which is driven largely by local tv contracts the Twins are sort of middle of the pack between like 15th and 22nd or something. And that's where they sit this year in payroll. So he's going to tell you, well, we're, you know, we're not going to be able to spend on the level of the Red Sox and the Yankees and some of these top teams and the Dodgers. So for us to preserve a level of competitiveness year after year, we can't go all in and trade prospects. We rely on those prospects to come up and be big league players like Luis Arise and Alex Kirloff. So if you start trading from that pool of players and then you don't, follow up with a, a championship, now you're left with maybe five years of dormancy while you build back up again. Mm -hmm. To which I say, I don't care. <laughs> like, I, it's been 30 years since they've won a championship. They've been competitive, but not championship level for 20 years, going back to 2021-22. I say, go make it happen sometime this year or next year while you have a nucleus, while you've got these players under contract. I just don't think they should be as afraid of, well, if we go too far down the path of trading prospects, what's our team going to look like in 2025? Yep. I don't know. Figure it out in 2025. That's what I say. 
Well, and I also think that it has to be taken on a year by year, case by case basis of what's the window and what's the opportunity. And I mean, I think the one thing that's going to stand out if they don't take the chance this season is the fact that this was the year that Carlos Correa was dropped in your lap. I'm literally Scott Boras said, my guy likes to hit there. He can't find a long-term contract. He's a superstar. He's a superstar at shortstop and at the plate. And so he'd like to play for you probably for one year, right? So if you say to that, well, yeah, I mean, we got him for a year, but it just wasn't the right time. Then my question becomes, when do you identify the right time? What? So if Carlos Correa is not going to put you over the theoretical top of, we got to no. try and win right now, what's it going to take to get there? Because at this point, then I have no clue. Yeah, no. So actually, all right, I have a hot take that I want to throw at you here. Because we're, we're kind of kind of tiptoeing around something. And I, I did tweet this out a few weeks ago, and it generated a lot of backlash. I want, I want to throw it out on the show and get your guys' thoughts. But uh, let's, let's first welcome a new partner to the show here. Our friends at Equity Partners, fittingly, new partner of Mackie and Judd and Purple Daily. All right. Uh, our guy Ryan, who uh, owns the company, is a huge Vikings fan, a uh, huge listener of Scorn Our Shows. And his company is called Equity Partners. And they believe the house selling process should be 100% hassle free. So they offer traditional listings, all cash offers, but where they really stand out is their WeHab program, where they will partner with you to fix up your home before you put it on the market. From simple fixes to full remodels, they'll help you get the most value for your home. And, and this might be the biggest benefit, you can move before you sell. Think about how we've all been through this where it's like, all right, I'm gonna, I'm gonna sell my home and then, uh, well, then I got to line it up with when I'm going to buy my home. Oh. And it's just like the timing of it is a pain. They eliminate that hassle for you. You can put offers in on your next home, non-contingent on the sale of yours when you work with Equity Partners. EquityPartnersMN.com. That's EquityPartnersMN.com. What a pain in the ass that is. You know, you just say, oh, well, how do I time this up? Oh, when's the uh -huh. closing date? Do I have to pay double rent or mortgage or whatever? It's just... Uh, Equity Partners, here to help you guys. The fixing uh, up things is the biggest thing, because I can't fix a thing. We know. I know. It's okay. That's why your friends at Equity Partners. I've been good lately. I've been really good. Mm. <coughs> yeah, uh, yeah. Also, a shout out to our friends at Dennis Kirk and DennisKirk.com. So it's riding season in and around the Twin Cities, greater Minnesota area. And Dennis Kirk has over 160,000 parts and accessories in stock for riding season, whether it's a Harley, Indian, Metro Cruiser, Sport Bike, whatever it is, you'll find what you need at DennisKirk.com. Same day shipping on orders placed before 8 p.m. and free shipping on orders over $89. Ride more, wait less at DennisKirk.com. Here's my hot take. If the Twins aren't going to make an aggressive move for a top-end starter like a Luis Castillo or a Frankie Montas, and I would say two lights-out relievers. I think this team needs a lights-out starter and then two lights-out relievers. Because right now, I mean, who? I think last week I said, well, the Twins have maybe two or three reliable relievers. It's pretty much one. They have Duran is their reliable reliever, and then the other guys are all sort of streaky or, you know, walk the plank, whatever. Right. So you need a couple more of those guys. If you're not willing to do those things as a front office and ownership group, then shouldn't you just look to trade Carlos Correa at the trade deadline. I know this sounds crazy because the Twins are tied for first place and they're you know seven games over 500, but he can opt out of his contract and become a free agent at the end of the year. So to me, there's not much gray area. Either you put chips on the table and build this thing for a Carlos Correa run in October. Yep. And if you're not willing to do that, then you should probably take his value and trade it to another team to get something that, to help you in 2023, 24, so he doesn't just opt out and walk and you get nothing. Is that too much of a black and white scenario? I don't want the gray area. Well, we're going to hang on to Correa, but we're not really going to make a move at the deadline. And for what? For what purpose? Either go all in or just cash your chips in and, you know, put them on the 2023, 2024 table. Mm -hmm. I, I think we this show if we can pat ourselves on the back for a little bit, I think this show does a really good job of having conversations before everyone else starts having conversations or having thoughts and ideas and whatnot. You can't On trade Barrios. What are no. you guys talking what about? What the hell are you talking about? One year about? ago this week, basically. Yes, basically. 
Um, but with Correa, I think the idea of trading him, I, I actually will say I do think it's a little premature to have that thought and conversation. Uh, two, I also believe because he's going to opt out, I really don't think you're going to get more than like a fourth or fifth best prospect from a team because that team knows he's going to opt out. So you're not you're you're most likely not going to get a one or two prospect number one or two. Well, they got Joe prospect. Ryan for Nelson Cruz. True, but I, but wasn't he like the third or fourth best prospect in the Rays organization? Well, if you can get another Joe Ryan, I guess is what I'm saying. If there's a Joe sure. Ryan equivalent guy out there, then well, I guess I, I don't want to trade him. Just to be clear, mm-hmm. I don't want to trade him. Just, and I, I I would let it ride because also like. Just from the prospect hoarding that the Twins do, I don't really care about acquiring a third or fourth prospect. I care more about Carlos Correa being in a Twins uniform and trying to build around him to two yard grand point, which I agree with. But I don't, I'm not really interested in selling him, you know, to Toronto or Boston, getting their fourth best prospect, letting him bake in the minor leagues for a year, and he might not even pan out. Um, I, I'm with you. Go find pitching. Go find it now. Uh, but I, I think as of the idea of selling Correa, I, I do think. We should, as we, as we used to say, as Ron used to say, pump the brakes a little bit on on that idea. If you if you are going to choose door two, because I do agree with Phil, I think this I, this one, unlike most things in sports and life, is black and white. If if you're going to choose door two, you should be fired. <laughs> when you get Carlos Correa, I will again say it. This is Minnesota. You have been gifted by his agent. This was not like. Falvey, Levine, St. Peter, and Polad sitting down being like, how do we brew up a Carlos Correa? This is going to be great. The Scott Boros came to them and said, I've done some looking around. My guy likes your ballpark. He likes your town. He can't find a long-term contract. I am going to, like Santa Claus on Christmas Day, come down your twins target field chimney and deliver Carlos Correa. All right. We're not talking about some shortstop who's like, you're like, oh, that guy's not bad. But you're talking about a shortstop who is a needle mover, difference maker, caused some people, dumb or not, to buy season tickets on the spot, on the spot. If you say, yeah, you know, I don't feel like this is the year. Eh, We can't make it. No, no, no. We're going to try and trade. I think you should be fired. And I'm not joking. And this is not hyperbole. This is my biggest problem with the 2022 Twins. At so many junctures, and I, I should say this, I'll preface this, if they do, if they picked door two or, or didn't like add on, for all we talk about process, their processes are far too often flawed. And that's in game, that's in strategies of roster construction. This to me is very clear. You need to go surround Carlos Correa with what you feel is the proper talent to give yourselves a chance because this division sucks all right but if you can up the competitive level of your team against the rest of the american league which has a great team in the yankees and the astros are damn good but there you have every opportunity to win this division outright if you do this right you have every opportunity then to have a good enough team where if you get in the playoff pool with the chips that we're talking about adding around Correa, you give yourself an you give yourself a chance to win, all right? If this is not the year to do that, like if you're like, well, nah, we had too many relievers and then we need too many, you know, then I think that your process is so flawed that if I'm Jim Polad, I'm looking elsewhere for people whose processes aren't as flawed. Right, of course. I go, well, why do you need so many relievers is a question that I would ask a front office that came in sort of touting itself as you know, pitching whispers. Why, why, why do, why are you, why do you have one reliable reliever is the, probably the, the biggest, the biggest question. But, and I just, I just want to clarify because this got lost in translation when I threw this out on social a couple weeks ago. Sure. I am not advocating for them to trade Carlos Correa. I'm bringing that up as an option to show you how absurd it would be if they didn't choose door number one, mm-hmm. which is put some chips on the table here. You got Carlos freaking Correa. You signed him for $35 million. And I get they're not going to do this tomorrow because, you know, it, it's going to take another team to tango with you. So they're going to have to hold their own against Cleveland and other teams for the next probably four weeks until a trade can actually be consummated. That's the unfortunate part about the way these discussions go down. Teams like to t- carry it up until the deadline to leverage desperate teams against each other. So you probably have to hang on for dear life. 
either get hot again or just stay above 500, stay within striking distance, and then look to add in four weeks from now. But if you're unwilling to add, if you're unwilling to say, oh, the price is too steep for Frankie Montaz, we can't give up that and that. Yep. What are your options? You're just going to ride it out and then Correa walks? I would just say be aggressive doing one thing or the other, specifically one thing, which is add pieces to this year's team. So off my point about the process, there is one thing from last night's game that this morning remained stuck in my craw. And again, it comes back to the process being wrong. So this is not just like one game. Oh my God, they, they, they lost this game. It's terrible. But these games are, are important. Um, they have they had going to last night 16 games left against this team, which they're, they're clearly going to compete against for the American League Central title. And I don't know there's going to be a wild card from this division because it's not a good di division for the most part. But anyway, uh, here's the one thing. And Rocco gave a long explanation, and it's, again, something I didn't find sufficient. So Arise hits a three-run homer to give the Twins the lead in the bottom of the seventh. And I guess around that time... Or before that, Pagan was up and throwing. And somebody asked, rightfully so, did you consider Duran at that point? Mm -hmm. Be because this all goes back to, forget the closer. The closer is the guy that comes in when you need the most important outs, not the ninth inning outs. And Rocco's, Rocco said, well, we had Pagan up, and we didn't want to get Duran heated up and sit him again, because then he can't pitch. And I guess my thought process is, all right, but you took the lead. Duran is obviously your best guy. Like I, it's not close. Um, so you're saying they had Pagan up when the game was tied, or I, when yeah. they were, or when they were losing. They, they were, were losing. losing by I believe he was up, and he was going to come in and pitch the eighth. But then Arise hits the three run blast, and so at that point they're up five to three. And Rocco's thing was, well, we can't get Duran up at that point because Pagan was up, and we don't want to heat uh, uh, Duran up, and that's going to be a problem. My point is this. Or he, again, was he saying that you don't want to heat Pagan up and sit him down because you can't bring him back? No, he doesn't care about Pagan. He literally said that. No, no. But, but, he didn't, but was Duran... Sorry, I was on a plane when this game was Duran happening. was not up. But he was saying we had Pagan up. I didn't want to get Duran up too and then sit him. And, Why would you and, sit him? Bring him in. Sorry. Right. <laughs> doesn't no, make any sense. <laughs> no, I know. Go back and watch the clip. Go back and watch the clip. What I'm saying is this: this is a game against Cleveland. You are up by a game on, on them. And while I don't think the standings in June are incredibly important, I do think that the games against them are important. You take a lead. Why would you at that point in time? So so there is, at that point, there is one out. Arise hits a three-run homer. It's 5-3, okay? One out. You have every opportunity to pivot, in my opinion, and say, oh, wow, we just took a two-run lead. And we are about to face the, just to be clear here, gentlemen, the, the best three, part, yeah. three, four, and five in the order. And you still stick with what your process was while trailing. Explain that to me. Okay. How many? All right. All right. All right. I got so, the scorecard right here. I got the scorecard right here's here. Here's my question. So stuck how in many, my craw, Phil. How many outs were there? Well, I answered my own question. When a rise hit that home run. One out. There was one out. That's correct. So you, you still had... It, if there were two outs and he hits the home run and oh my god, and then the next guy comes up first pitch swinging and the inning's over, maybe you don't have enough time to heat someone up. Correct. But he hits the home run. I think in that spot too, when there's a couple guys on base, isn't or shouldn't Duran be at least doing some shoulder loosening exercises at that point? Oh man, we got now we got our best hitters coming up with two guys on base. This game could change in a heartbeat, right? So this is where I'd love to talk to like our guy Glenn Perkins or somebody and say, okay, that game shifts on a dime. You go from down 3-2 to up 5-3, and now there's, you know, Buxton's coming up, Correa's coming up, but now, and there's two innings left, but the best part of their order is coming up. That is a prime spot for Duran to come in. Totally agree with you. Is that enough time for him to get heated up? All right, you got one out, two batters, heat it up quick, and then you can come out and get some warm-up pitches. Or maybe what you do in that spot, I don't know, do they let you, if you come out with the new rules, if you come out, so, uh, so Cotton pitched the seventh for the Twins, right? Yes. And um, if if you need more time, can Cotton come out and and throw warm up pitches for the eighth, and then you make the pitching change before the first batter, or is it once he starts warming up before I, the inning, he I has to that, face? I think you're right. I think once he starts to warm up, he has to face a he has to face a batter. Okay, but I guess I guess to your grand point here, 
However you make it happen, Duran is by far your best relief pitcher. Pagan is solid and has he misses bats, but he also walks the plank and he's very up and down. What I don't understand, and I have not heard the Rocco clip is, I would be more concerned about heating. You heated Pagan up, and now you're telling Pagan, okay, we're going to actually, sorry, uh, three-run homer change things. Now we got to shut you down for a second. I would be worried about maybe losing Pagan for if the, if the Cleveland ties it later or something. But the Duran thing makes no sense. I don't. I, and maybe I don't know. Maybe I need to just go listen to the clip. And Why Durant can't pitched, you heat him up? And and Duran came in and pitched the ninth and tenth, so he's out tonight regardless. Yeah. So it's not Weird. like you were like we're gonna have him pitch an inning. Um, hopefully the ninth on Tuesday, so we can bring him back on Wednesday. So he's not going to pitch tonight. And in Rocco basically said on Pagan, we we don't worry about him getting up and sitting down, but with Duran we do. But he but, wouldn't have sat down. Well, why would he have sat down? Is maybe he's saying we would have had to get Duran up when we were losing three to two because we can't just wait until. Oh my God! A three-run homer, and now you got five right. minutes. So but I, I'm arguing, I get that. But I'm arguing that actually you could have pivoted at, at that point, because to what you said, there's one out. Arise hits the home run. Pagan's up. Okay, I call the bullpen. We now have a two-run lead, which by the and and Duran can pitch two, so he can pitch the eighth and ninth. We now have a lead. I want to hold that lead. Who gives me my best opportunity to do that? Yeah. Duran does. I think he's probably, I think what he would say, and it's, maybe this is the follow-up to Rocco, is is it, when the lead changes with one out and you've got two batters left, is that enough time if those guys both strike out or whatever, like Buxton struck out and Correa grounded out, is that enough time for Duran to get ready to pitch two innings? And he probably would say no. I'd say maybe you have to change your uh, your process there to get your best pitcher right, in against ta- the best part of their lineup. And that's my point. I think a lot of the processes are flawed at times. Mm-hmm. All right, look at that. Just a deep dive into the Minnesota Twins. Football. Sitting here on June 22nd. Uh, we're going to get to write that down predictions and an accountability session as Declan looks to continue the greatest season in write that down history. Mackie and Judd. <laughs> 